We all have to recognize that the hope that other people need is something that we already carry with us every day of our lives. And we can give it to those people that need it when they're the most in need. And when we give people hope, uh, we change their lives. Hey, what's up, everybody? Championship Leadership. We got a we got a special episode here for us today. We got we're getting tag teamed. We got Rick Yarish and Tom Murphy with us here today on the show. Thanks for being here, guys. Thank you for having us, Nate. I appreciate it very much. I, uh, yeah, absolutely. I learned Tom uh, is sticking it to Rick. He's in Costa Rica, just hanging out with his his feet up in the air while Rick has to go work and uh pennsylvania of all places today so yeah gotta pay for tom's vacation tom's got a big smile on his face he doesn't seem to mind so no, oh. he does not. <laughs> all right well listen i was gonna save this for later on in the show but i'll do it right <laughs> i'll do it right now let me give you some words of wisdom here nate um oh, oh boy it's probably, probably a little early to get into this part of the conversation but you should write this down nate never get in a roasting battle with a guy that's been roasted <laughs> because he always True wins story. yeah now let me let me tell you let me tell you a quick story so one of the great things about rick yarish and hopefully i'll get a chance to talk about rick here on the show uh rick has taught me some incredible lessons and <clears throat> being a tough guy and um you know i've participated in some sports that some people consider tough and you know i've wrestled my whole life being a tough guy, sometimes it's tough to show your feelings and it's tough to yeah. laugh, laugh at yourself. Right. And so when I meet Rick, um, you know, at first year and a half or so, I didn't joke around with him at all because, you know, I treated him like a wounded little puppy dog. And sure. you know, it was probably yeah. the worst thing I could have done because Rick wants you to treat him like he's normal and like he's your friend. Mm -hmm. And so it really wasn't until, you know, one, about a year and a half into our relationship, um, I'd never seen Rick in a wheelchair. And uh, he called me and he said, hey, man, I'm going to get to the hotel real late, but I'm going to be in my wheelchair because he has a prosthetic leg. And, and I was like, well, that's fascinating. And that whole year I was vlogging with my vlog camera. And um, Rick hates the camera. And just like a good friend, whenever I would pull it out, he'd say highly inappropriate things on his breath <laughs> in school so you can't use the footage like a, like a good friend would do. Yeah, make, yeah. Him do and, a, uh, make him do a ton of editing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Torture, torture. But anyway, so so I, I he gets there real late, so I didn't wait up. And if you think about it, if you see a picture, Rick, his hands are kind of fused together. Um, and, um, you know, he's got one leg. And he always tra he used to travel with his dog, his bag, his shirts. And, and if you think about it, if you're in a wheelchair, Nate, you, you, you think about propelling your hand yourself forward. Yeah, sure, right. But then you think, okay, well, if you can't use your hands, then you'll use your legs. But you think, well, he's only got one leg, so how does he yeah. do it? With his dog and his shirt and his bag. And so I get up real early in the morning because I missed him coming in at night because he got there late. And I'm sitting down at breakfast and I got my camera and I position <laughs> myself right in front of the elevator, right? And I'm sitting there. And, and I really wasn't messing around, honest yeah. to God. I wasn't okay. messing around. Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, I would like antagonize him a little bit, but sure. I wouldn't let him know I was doing it because, you know, we just weren't there yet. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there at breakfast. The place is packed. And here comes the elevator doors. They go ding and they open up. And Rick pulls him, he, and he hooks his heel on the floor and he pulls himself forward one pull at a time. And uh, really fascinating. Yeah. And Rick comes out. And he gets about three pulls out and he looks at me and his head kind of like drops to the side. Like, really? Are you really <laughs> starting this early? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Nate, here's the punchline. All of a sudden, his head snaps up and he looks like this to the left and to the right. And he goes, excuse me, sir. Must you film a disabled man? <laughs> and then he goes right to the door. And I'm just holding my camera and everybody <laughs> in the place is looking at me. Yeah, because you got to remember, no one in this place knows that we know each other. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. So, and I didn't say anything else. I just rolled to the door and I said it extremely loud. <laughs> uh -huh. Well played, sir. He was yeah. trying to get some good footage, but yeah. if you want to see antagonizing, all you got to do is go to our Instagram and watch one yeah. of our reels where I have my What's your Instagram? Uh, yeah, Sweet Arts and Heroes on Instagram. And if you go there and you watch one of the reels of me taking my service dog out to go to the bathroom oh, in the yeah. middle of the winter, there's Tom <laughs> recording me. 
and you will see what it looks like when I am uh, oh, being that's good an- antagonized stuff. by yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I love it. You guys are a good, good pair. Uh, well, why don't yeah, real quick, why don't you guys introduce yourself for for the listener that that does isn't familiar with who you are, and then also what it is that you guys are up to. Hey, go ahead, Rick. All right, yeah. So um, I'm Rick Yarish, and uh, I um, am a wounded soldier. I was wounded uh, back in 2006, and uh, today I am married. Uh, I have uh, two children, my wife Amy, and I have my two daughters uh, Grace and Tenley. Uh, three and 11. And, uh, you know, we talk about the things that we love in this world. And, you know, we were talking about families and that's the most important thing in my life. And the other most important thing in my life right now is uh, what I get to do in schools with uh, Sweethearts and Heroes. So those are the two most important things in my life um, right now, certainly. Sorry, Tom, you didn't crack that list. Uh, well, he's a piece <laughs> of the sweetheart in here, I guess. We'll, we'll include him in that. But, you know, as, as this thing goes, as this conversation goes on today, I think you'll realize the importance that Tom has in my life because mm-hmm. um, I wouldn't be doing the things I'm doing today. Uh, we've been almost in front of almost 2 million students now, and it, that wouldn't have happened without um, my meeting Tom. So that's a big part of um, where I'm at today. Gotcha. Well, Nate, I'm a, I'm a father just like you, and I really commend you when, before we started this podcast, I said, you know, what's your story? And I love that you started with your wife. I, you know, I too am married for 25 years, and uh, my wife is probably one of the most important things, if not the most important things on this earth to me. And I have uh, four children, uh, two that are in the service. And it's funny, I was talking to Rick about this the other day. I said, um, you know, I never pushed my kids in the military. They, they never... Um, it's really funny because when you talk about leadership, um, it, it just hit me the other day. I said, you know, Rick, I said, I think I have my kids joined the service because of you. And he was like, huh? I was like, yeah, I think they really did. And I never pushed think, my kids in the military. We were never yeah. a military family. Yeah. Um, but for 10 years, my kids have watched me talk about Rick. And you talk about leadership, you know, a lot of times I say leadership's never about what we say. It's about what we do. I, I do a whole thing on leadership and it's really fascinating to me and Mm -hmm. um you know i've been so blessed by the relationship i've had with rick yarish um and i too wouldn't be doing what i'm doing without him i told him this year that when he's done speaking sweethearts and heroes i'm probably done too but i'm a father for i was born and raised in philadelphia my parents ran a very unique kind of little mission home used to take people off the streets of philadelphia Uh, so i grew up with people uh that were really hopeless and, um, yeah. and as I got older, um, you don't talk about having homeless people live with you growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got involved in the sport of wrestling. It kind of dominated my life. I was a horrible student. Rick and I have that in common <laughs> as well. Uh, we flocked together. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I fell in love with education in college. I wrestled through college and led me to participate a little bit in some uh, professional sports and didn't really understand why I got into that, why the universe uh, pushed me that direction. Um, But I I figured it out because it brought me full circle back to the beginning of my life. Um, Started talking to young people about 15 years ago, kind of leadership, motivational kind of stuff. And a friend of mine that kind of is the joiner of where Rick and I intersected, um, asked me to do something on bullying one day, about 13 or 14 years ago. And I said, I said, yeah, I could probably do something and came up with this crazy little presentation called Sweethearts and Heroes. Very purposeful name. And, um, you know, I I did this one silly presentation and uh, another school asked me to do another one. And then I had this chance meeting with Rick Yarish, which, you know, uh, it's a wonderful story. And um, or our organization did, I should say. And I started telling that story to young people. Uh, Just a tiny little piece of what we talked about in our assembly. And uh, the universe had a different plan and uh, eventually got Rick and I together. And as Rick said, two million kids later uh, from wow. Houston to Hawaii to Montreal and back. Um, and uh, we're booked every single day of the school year. So it's, uh, it's incredible. But the most important thing I'll, I'll say and then I'll land this, uh, Nate, we have uh, I'm glad you shared about your children because it's never been harder to be a young person than in the world today. Yeah. Uh, the destructive decisions that young people are making have skyrocketed. Things like suicides have tripled in middle schoolers. And uh, I don't say that to scare you. And I know you have some kids in middle school and high school, uh, but it's real. And maybe that's the worst of the destructive decisions. 
And that's the path that Rick and I are on, is this path against this war against hopelessness. And uh, when you travel with one of the world's hope experts, you learn some amazing lessons and you get to pass them on to young people. So that's kind of a, it in a nutshell. And uh, um, yeah, that's the story, right. man. How, how'd you guys meet? Go for it, Rick. No, Tom, you tell it better because you lie. <laughs> you embellish the story <laughs> and you make it better. And that's, that, that's, that's why I was going, well, listen, I'll start the story that Rick can finish it. All right, and I don't lie. I just make them more colorful. Right, right, right. When you talk to young people, unfortunately, you have to entertain them yes, today. Yeah, right. Very difficult to compete with TikTok and things like that. So... Our, our, our one of our assemblies is 90 minutes. And when you go into a school and you tell a middle school principal, you're going to speak to their sixth, seventh and eighth graders for 90 yeah. minutes. They always say the same thing. Have you ever done this before? <laughs> yeah, <I bet. laughs> and when we get yeah. done, Nate, the kids will ask us to keep going after 90 uh -huh. minutes. It's uh, that entertaining, but it's also very um, uh, powerful, the message. But anyway, in a nutshell, man, you know, like I said, I had, we were speaking at a wrestling event. Um, I wrestled my whole life. And, um, you know, Rick was there. Uh, he got inducted to the National Wrestling Hall of Fame and uh, for his service to our country. He was a wrestler his whole life, too. And um, he was there, you know, doing a little speech. And, you know, when you meet Rick, you know, you, you put your hand out to shake his hand like, you know, you're supposed to do. And he throws his hands up and they're just different. And you're like, whoa, what do I do with that? Mm -hmm. And so you usually shake his wrist or, you know, now he just forces you to fist bump. He doesn't give you an option anymore. Yeah. Just don't, just don't blow it up at the end. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny that he says that to kids every day in school and they're like, yeah, like, what do I do with that? They don't know what to do with it. Uh, and anyway, the only way so, to become comfortable in life is to be uncomfortable first. Absolutely. Yeah. I hope Henry heard that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, so we were there, you, and, and we had this chance meeting with Rick and, um, you know, really impacted my life. This one little moment impacted my life. And, you know, and when, when you talk about tolerance, when you talk about those kind of things with kids, you know, middle schoolers are tough. You know, they just have this natural aversion and they're trying to figure out their different intergroups and, the, you know, who they're going to connect with. And, you know, and, and they say things, they use their immature brain and they don't think, and they say things that are very hurtful sometimes. And I'm sure they say that to you as a father yeah. and they say it to other kids. And so, you know, as I was trying to figure out this message initially, I would do this really crazy things where I'd get these kids and get the whole auditorium to stand up in a big circle uh, or the kids on the outside, you get a couple of hundred kids and I have this little plastic ping pong ball. You can get them on the internet or these little energy balls and they got two little metal clips on them and you put your finger on one. The other person puts their finger on the other. And then if everybody joins hands in a giant circle, the ball will light up. It's really fascinating because the human oh, wow. body is a good co conductor of electricity. Yeah. Nate, it doesn't matter if you have five people or 500. Uh -huh. If one person isn't touching hands, skin, yeah. Yeah. the ball won't light up and make this little crazy noise. Wow. I wish I had one here. I'd show it to you. Yeah. But anyway, so I used to do this crazy thing start the assembly going really well. And then I get up on a couple of chairs and uh, get these kids to try and hold hands, talk about this ball. And it turns into a disaster. <laughs> because if you think of a couple of hundred middle schoolers standing up and you ask them to hold hands, hold hands. Yeah. Yeah. Not happening. Not happening. Yep. <laughs> and I would know that this, it was like almost like a plan. So I get up on these chairs. Okay. We're all going to hold hands. One, two, three, nothing. And the teachers are like, oh, my gosh, this is a, a train wreck because, you know, you're next to Sally. Yeah, she's next to yeah. Jimmy. Anyway, long story short, I always got down, pushed myself to the center of this mass of students, kind of dejected. And then I dropped this picture on the screen of Rick that was one of the 100 faces of war, war that was in the Smithsonian. And I would talk about when I met him and you go to reach out and grab his hand and you're like, oh, and then I would just tell this real somber story of like, if that was the last hand and you needed it to survive, you'd grab it. So have a little courage, have some tolerance, hold that person's hand. And really amazing, even in a bunch of young people that really have no real understanding of what it means to commit and to serve, mm -hmm. they would always do it. 
And yeah. I had a hundred percent success rate out of about 50,000 kids. Wow. And then, you know, they'd all, and then I'd get back up on the chairs, hold hands, the ball would light up. Teachers would be crying. They'd be like, oh my God, that was like, and so I did this to all these kids. And then I got a little spooked. I'm like, because Rick wouldn't have remembered our organization. It was just this quick meeting. Like, hi, yeah. how you doing? I'm here to teach wrestling. You're here to speak. And uh, so we got a little spooked. And so I sent him a bunch of emails. Hey, Rick, you don't remember me. We met. I'm using your story. Because I figured, you know, I'm getting this cease and desist order from this wounded <laughs> veteran that yeah. says, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I sent him a bunch of letters, uh, emails. Never responded <laughs> and, and don't say anything yet, Rick. I'm going to let you jump. I'm going to let him take over the look story. At him, look at him taking control of this yeah. whole thing. I know, I know. But, but I love when he tells the story. But anyway, so I sent him all these notes. And then I'm like, just screw it. Like, at least I tried. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So he must be okay with it. And he never responded one time. And then, Nate, the universe takes over. And I don't know. I get a little chills thinking about this even today. Yeah. But I don't know what your belief system is, universe, the structure of reality, but it had another plan for Rick and I. And this is where I'll let Rick kind of take over and he'll tell you how the universe uh, unfolded the Sweethearts and Heroes message from uh, probably about a three or four second meeting um, over a year or two before. Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, I was getting those emails and the texts and the phone calls and the voicemails and stuff like that. Stalker. Loud. What's that? Yeah, Stalker right. Stalker level. Stalker. And, and, you know, the, the other guy that I had met that same day is bigger and balder and has more tattoos. And they're talking about anti-bullying. And I'm like, what is the, what are these guys doing? It's just weird. And honestly, I didn't care if they were using my story or not. Like, so sure. whatever. Um, I didn't really want anything to do with it. I was doing my own thing. I was at, that's why I was at that wrestling event that day speaking. And um, I was comfortable doing what I was doing. I didn't really want to be a part of a structured uh, speaking organization. Yeah, so okay. I kind of ignored it. Um, but then uh, something really weird happened after that meeting, probably. Yeah, but, but, but Rick, you forgot. What about the hero part? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, there's Tom again jumping in and just changing <laughs> the story. Now I got to find, I got to make something up because he's lying. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so the one part I heard the name of the organization was Sweethearts and Heroes. And when I heard the word hero, hmm. I figured that's why they wanted me on the team. Like, okay, we got our hero. We got the soldier who, you know, was in the Iraq, wow, okay. and in Iraq, and he'll be the hero of Sweethearts and Heroes. So I didn't want to be in a school parading myself as a hero. I would never consider myself a hero. Now, I understand that other people will do that, and that is fine with me, but I can't do that for myself, and I won't. Sure. Um, so I wouldn't, I didn't want to join because of that for one. And then just anti-bullying and I was doing my own thing. It just didn't seem like a right fit for me at that time. Yeah. Um, but months went by, you know, after I had received those emails and things, and then I got this uh, phone call and the phone call is just, it's unbelievable that this phone call came to me because uh, to finish the story, I got to go back 20 years before that day. I was speaking at that wrestling, um, that, that wrestling uh, um camp that I was speaking at. So uh, Tom started Sweethearts and Heroes with uh, a guy named Jason. And Jason and uh, Tom knew each other from wrestling in college together. And uh, after, uh, so Jason went to college or high school in Queensbury, New York. And uh, Jason was best friends with this guy named Shane. And uh, they were played football together, captain of the football teams together, hung out at each other's houses. They were just best friends. And then when they graduated, um, they separated. And uh, they hadn't actually seen each other in 20 years. So 20 years goes by. They haven't communicated oh. in any way. And uh, they ran into each other around Christmas time. And they started talking about life and, uh, you know, their families and what they were doing in their life. And, you know, Jason had mentioned to Shane about Sweethearts and Heroes that he started this organization. <laughs> and uh, he also mentioned to Shane that uh, they met this guy named Rick Yarish and you know we've been trying to get a hold of him for months now and he won't get back to us <laughs> and as soon as Jason said my name to Shane Shane said did you just say Rick Yarish <laughs> and Jason's like yeah why and Shane said I was Rick's physical therapist in the hospital in San Antonio Texas no way wow. so after they graduated high school Jason and Shane Jason you know went to college became a teacher and, and Shane joined the army as a medic yeah 
okay. ended up as a physical therapist in the hospital in San Antonio. And wow. I had no clue there was a connection between those two. Yeah, right. Then that phone call that I got was from Shane. And okay. Shane said, hey, will you please get a hold of me? <laughs> they got something important. Um, so a couple of weeks after that, I met up with uh, Tom at a, at a subway. And uh, that's, the, that's the short, simple story right there. We met at a subway. And I'm sure <laughs> Tom got a couple, a couple of meatballs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let, let me let me just make one last quick comment about this. You know, Rick's right. Um, you know, when I was speaking to young people, whatever I was saying, man, to these young people during these presentations when I first started this thing, um, I would find myself in the auditorium after presentations, and young people would always sneak back in, just a handful, one or two, every presentation. Lights would be going down, and usually they'd want to tell me their story. And, you know, it just brought me back to my childhood. And it was my brothers and sisters growing up. You know, yeah. I used to spend a lot of time going to prison on the weekends to visit these people that my parents would take in. And um, it was the same story, just yeah. struggling with life. And I just found myself right back at the beginning, you know, um, talking to people that were really hopeless. And, you know, we all think we've gone through difficult things in life. And, um you know, I've had struggles myself, but I've never, never been at the end of my rope. Mm -hmm. ever. And, yeah. you know, these young people just were struggling. And, and, and I found myself talking about hope. And, you know, hope for our organization really means hold on possibilities exist. And I've already said this, that you know, we have a lot of young people, um, you know, during uh, this is an unbelievable statistic I just read two days ago. You know, 30 percent of 10 to 14 year old young ladies have considered suicide you know, since 2021, 30%. Yeah. That's like one out of three or four young ladies in right. America. Right. And so, <clears throat> you know, I was talking to all these young people, you know, uh, school after school. And, you know, what do you say to them? It's going to be okay, buddy. But I don't really understand the position that they're in. I don't understand hope and hopelessness. And so really, at the end of the day, it had nothing to do with Rick's status as a hero, as he said, that never even crossed my mind. Sure. The fact was I needed someone, we needed someone that really understood what it means to give up, to say, I'm not holding on. There are no possibilities for my future. Because when you look at Rick and you say, like, who the heck wants to wake up next to that for the rest of their life? And we say, oh, come on, Tom, love is on the inside. Yeah, until you look like that, you know, mm -hmm. until that's your story. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard Rick's story and I did my research on him and I watched a couple early interviews that he did, I said, man, that's the guy. That's the guy that we need to talk to young people about this utter feeling of hopelessness. And so when I met him at that subway, I begged him. I said, man, just come and watch. Just yeah. come and watch one assembly. And he did. And uh, two million kids later from Houston to Hawaii to Montreal and back. Um, you know, I travel with one of the world's hope experts and we yeah. couldn't, we, you, you don't have enough time in the next week to hear the stories yeah. uh, of imagine. the impact that this man has had on young people across this country. Yeah. That's incredible what you guys are doing. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I remember I, part of the reason I do what I do today, I think kind of is I remember every single student assembly like I ever had. And I just loved it, you know, and they never really told you when it was going to happen. Like for us, it was just all of a sudden over the PA, they're like, Hey, you know, everybody to the gymnasium or to the auditorium, like we get a speaker. And I was like, you know, you, you're out of class. Right. But then I, I remember like the speakers, I remember the stories. And I also just remember like how crazy this is that this is what people do for a living. Like they go across the country, school to school and like, <laughs> motivate and inspire kids and like get paid to do it like that's awesome and how do you do that you know and i think i just kind of filed that away and and uh but yeah to for you guys to be able to do that but also obviously it's uh, you know the difference that you're making because of it pretty pretty amazing so appreciate well, we, you guys. Lo we love the opportunity that we get you know i get to spend time with little kids in their classrooms after we do our presentations and one of the questions the kids always ask me is, do you have a job? 
<laughs> I love it. Because to them, this doesn't seem. I can yeah, them, totally like right. I'm, I'm standing in a classroom and I'm smiling and I'm laughing, and yeah. it doesn't sound like a job. A job yeah. sounds like something you're forced to do to make money. And, right, right. Um, yeah. It's funny when these little kids ask, "Do you have a job?" And I'm like, "Well, yeah. I'm in schools almost five days a week." <laughs> yeah, <so." laughs> that is kind of my job. But yeah. I love it. It's hard to consider it a job because it is. That's as a kid, that's what you think of a job. Like, oh, uh, something you're forced to yeah. do to make some money. Yeah, well, like I said, that was the same thought I had. I I, rem- I just I remember like pe- people do this, like this is what they do. It's <laughs> amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. What's uh what's the big vision for you guys? What what are you hoping to do to accomplish and you know for how long? And well, uh, you know, yeah, do you have like a, a, a vision five, 10 years from now? Well, man, I you know, my goal from day one has been to reach 50 million public school students. That's the number, roughly the number of students in this country. Okay. And, um, you know, we could spend way too much <clears throat> time talking about our future. Um, you know, for me, it's about, um, you know, I, I love what Mother Teresa said. She said, never worry about the numbers. She said, just help that person next to you. Yeah. You've changed the world. And I think that our, our goal is to change the world. And, you know, sometimes people hear that and hear a lot of people say stuff. I want to have an impact on the world, but sometimes you forget that, you know, the universe, you know, I think it was Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you know, that, that said, um, he wrote the, the Gulag Archipelago, and he said that uh, the, the universe has as many centers as human beings. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, Nate, you and Henry and Lisa and Nick, Rick and myself, and you're, you're all the center of the universe because when it's over, the lights go out the universe ends essentially. I mean, I don't know what happens afterwards, if anything, but it's over. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I can talk about the big plan of hitting 50 million kids. And that's ultimately this big goal plan is to introduce kids to this message that I know changes and saves lives. Yeah. I've seen it with my own eyes. Yeah. But at the end of the day, man, you know, the only thing that matters is when your son Henry's struggling. That's the only thing that matters in your life when your daughters are struggling. So for me, man, it's one kid at a time, even though we have a big plan. Um, But we really have no idea what we're doing, Nate. We started out, uh, we're just a couple of dumb wrestlers. uh, (laughs) You know, it's been a thing of beauty. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, the name of the podcast is Championship Leadership. And uh, I, you know, I I struggle with the word leader uh, in my own life. Um, You know, I, I tell people I'm one heck of a soldier. And uh, you give me you give me a job to do, and I'll do it to the, the best of my ability, and I will do it mm-hmm. as much as I can. Now, there's leadership in that, certainly, um, but uh, you know, Tom is one of the best leaders that I've ever followed. You know, so I just get I get to be a soldier who says, you know, I'm following your lead, and there is leadership in that. Like, I don't know if I consider myself much of a leader, but when people come up to me and they say, I don't know how you don't see yourself as a leader. I mean, that right there tells me that I have some leadership qualities, but um, I do, uh, I follow, I follow the leader and, uh, you know, he's got a a plan. I don't know what the plan exactly is, uh, but that's okay because I trust uh, him. And, you know, I think that's a huge part of leadership is just trusting that person that's going to lead the way and I'm going to be there to make it as successful as possible. Yeah. Well, I was just talking about God and 30 minutes ago before you guys on a different podcast. So uh, absolutely. Um, and obviously, you know, I think championship leadership, right? Leaders, most of the greats will never, you'll never hear them talk about how great of a leader they are. <laughs> like that's so right there, Rick. I mean, just the fact that you're obviously having a hard time even admitting that you are a leader, uh, uh no doubt that you 100% absolutely are. So, um, oh, yeah, receive that for sure. Like, cause you're making a difference, man. You both are. Um, we heard all the good, cool stories and you guys obviously have an incredible relationship. What have been some of the tough moments for you guys inside of your relationships? <laughs> inside of our relationships. Yeah. I, was, I thought yeah. you were going to say some of the tough, cause you know, well, between school, you and Tom, I guess is what I'm, what I'm. Oh yeah. No, I know yeah. exactly what yeah, you're yeah, saying. Yeah. I would say, you know, kind of beyond that one, I'll get into that in a sec, but you know, with the, <laughs> what we, what we do in schools is tough as well. You know, it's a lot of fun, but hearing the stories of the hopeless kids, um, you know, Tom said that, you know, mm-hmm. I can kind of relate with these kids because of the hopelessness. I can't relate with their story at all. 
Yeah. I can't because yeah. I'm not a 13 year old who's dealing with the things that they're dealing with, but I can relate with hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is the tough part of our job for sure. But we know that that's why we're there. That's why yeah. we're there. So with, with Tom and I though, um, we have, we have a good relationship and, you know, we start really hard in the school year in September when the school year kicks off in uh, New York and, uh, you know, Tom's gonna be doing stuff all summer, but uh, in September we kick it off and we go together until June. Like it's full mm -hmm. time. We see each other. And by October, I am sick of him. <laughs> you, know, you already said October, right? Yeah, yeah about, about, a month, right, right, right. about a month yeah. into it. Yeah. About a month into it. And yeah. I, I'm just saying, oh man, it's got a little longer. So, <laughs> One day at a time here. But no, I, I think, you know, like we, we, we have spent, um, the last, I don't know how many, unless it falls on a weekend, uh, Valentine's day. We spent the, every single Valentine's Day together, unless it's on a weekend. I've seen Tom more than I've seen my wife on mm. Valentine's Day. Uh, Tom has seen me more on his anniversary than he sees his wife because he mm. was not very smart and got married during the school year. <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, that's our relationship. I mean, you know, we have we certainly had some uh, tough spots along the way, but I can't even really pinpoint um, too many of them, like. You know, I think the, the school year gets a little taxing. Like, you know, it feels like June. It does. It, it certainly does after that long school year sure. of being in school so many times. Um, but that's not, that's just overall. I wouldn't even put that on our relationship together. Um, but it is going to be good not to see him for two months. Well, you know, if, <laughs> if I had to jump in on this, um, Rick said something to me at the beginning of the school year this year. And um, it really hit me in the heart. Um, and uh, you know, I can, I can, I'm overwhelming. If my wife were on here, you know, I, I don't have an off switch. I, I'm 24, <laughs> 7, 365. I don't stop. It's just on all the time. I, I don't take vacations. Like yeah. I, I will work every day on this vacation. Um, I don't remember the last time I took a vacation. Um, but after 25 years, my wife needed something because I'm gone all school year long. But we were in a hotel room early this year, and Rick said to me, he said, you know, he said, you know, you're you've changed. I'm like, what are you what are you talking about? I didn't change. <laughs> yeah. Said, no, you've really changed. And um, you know, I really, if I reflect, because it's a it's a really fascinating question you just asked, because um when I when I really sit back and have a little bit of self-awareness and really think about that question, I think I, I think I would have driven Rick away. Um, and I don't know if you'd admit this, but I, I know my nature and, you know, I am so incessant and over and over and over and over and over and over and in all areas of my life. And I can, Rick has an unbelievable radar. I've never met, maybe my wife has a very similar radar to Rick. <laughs> Rick can meet someone and in a split second, he could be like, uh, no, not a fan. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying he doesn't like the person's a human right. being, yeah. but right. he just can tell like that, that guy's acting. Something. Yeah, he, yeah. He's just not authentic and real. And so, um, and there's a part of me that I don't want to say I act, but I'm just very intense. I don't know any other way to say it. And Rick could tell you about that intensity. And it's like, I've had enough of this. And everybody that meets me, they're like, oh my God, I'd love to get to know this guy. And, in, until you know me for about a month, like <laughs> yeah. I've owned a, I owned a restaurant for 12 years, 70 employees, and everybody's like, I want to work for this guy yeah. until you do. Yeah, right. Or, and I should say work with me. I've never had an employee, but yeah. until you do, yeah. because people are like, does he stop this? But anyway, <laughs> so so my, my point is that I think Rick Yarish has changed my life more than almost any human being outside of my wife. Yeah. Just because I have had to become very aware of who I am in everything I say and do, uh, because I don't think we have enough of that as human beings. And and so I, I don't know if I'm really answering your question right now, but even the little irritating yeah. things that we do as a human, I have to pay attention to because Rick's radar is so good. And like I can start a sentence and he'll know immediately. I wish I had a couple of examples right <laughs> yeah. now, but like, I can't fool him on anything. 
yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, Rick, I, I met this person, and he's like, no, no, you didn't. <laughs> and he'll just know instantly. Yeah, so, yeah. so I, I guess, I guess that's how I'd answer the question. Is I, I could talk about some great moments of you know me breaking wind backstage and Rick being <laughs> so angry, he almost left the auditorium. And there's almost nothing more <laughs> angering in my life than somebody that will publicly do that. <laughs> I can remember in the army, man, almost killing someone because they did it <laughs> intentionally. But anyway, yeah. um, that was an accident. Love. But anyway. I happened, to, I happened to be at my in my wheelchair at that time, which oh. puts me, at, which puts me at what level? Oh no, exactly. Backblast, yeah, exactly. very not good. <laughs> and, but anyway, so, I could, oh. but those that story that's that's years ago too. Those are that's years ago, and I would say early on in our relationship. You know, trying to get to used to Tom's intensity level was a lot harder. I'd say these past, I don't even know, five, six years uh, have been very simple um, Mm -hmm. with our relationship. I don't, I I know what to expect, you know, like I know what the plan is. And even if there's not a plan, I know there is a plan and that that there's this like agenda that we have and we don't know exactly what we're doing when we go into some things, but I know in the end, it'll turn out awesome. I really do. Yeah. How do you guys make it work being gaunt? You know, you you touched on that. Like, not so, you don't see your family much. It sounds like. How does how does that? How do that's you a tough one. That? Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. So last year, at the end of last year, I talked to Tom and I said, "Man, I got a you know at that time a two year old and you know a ten year old and I'm I'm not home enough. I want to be with them. And we just got through COVID too, so I was home all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, you know, I love the relationship that I built during that time and i wanted to keep that going with my family so i told him i said i can't continue to do every day like we're doing um so he's like all right how about you know and he's he's very easy to work with in that way and he instantly said okay how about two weeks a month i was like that sounds great you know one week on one week off or two weeks uh consistent and then two weeks off and uh i was like that's awesome so we made that plan and then the next day he called me and he says well okay so listen um I don't know if I really meant that. I, meant, I said two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Can can you work all <laughs> September, October, and November? Can you work all of that? And I'm like, because that's when schools want us the most, sure. right? In the okay. beginning of the school. Yeah. So gotcha. We booked that. And then after that, it was, um, you know, two weeks a year. But I made the mistake of telling Tom I was available on Mondays as well. Um, <laughs> so I would be booked every Monday. And then, you know, Tuesday's right after Monday. So why not? Yeah, Tuesday. <laughs> right. no. But no, I, I have, I'm managing it. And honestly, we all, we both know that we cannot continue to do this forever. We do know that, um, you know, our families are first and mm-hmm. we have to learn the balance, but we're still, you know, we, we've been doing this for 12 years, but it's still, we're still yeah. early in the game, you know, of yeah. trying to figure it all out. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a tough one, man. And you know, I this is the podcast in itself for me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to look back someday, and I've you know, I sacrificed my family a lot uh, for this, and I'm not sure why the universe had me do it. And um, and number one, without my wife Wendy, this would have never happened. She's right. my biggest supporter. Um, she, um, it just wouldn't have happened. And she's just very. Um, that, yeah, that's an entire podcast. Absolutely. But, yeah. You know, and but but I have a lot of guilt, man, in my life around leaving my kids to go work with other kids. But I, I really believe that the example that I've set for them hopefully has put them on this trajectory to to change the world in their own sense. Um, and, you know, when you when you first ask that question, you know, it's it's really kind of fascinating because as I talked about self awareness, you know, I never saw myself during that time. But what's been mm-hmm. really fascinating for me is, and this is a like five podcasts for rick but rick got married after his injury that's a fascinating yeah. story <laughs> uh but he also you know his daughter Tenley came into his life when he was about five and she was about yeah, five almost four she was just almost at, the end of, at the end of three right and so she's 11 now but then this is an incredible that's a story in itself uh uh Tenley and amy uh but you know, Rick, we we're on stage. I was actually on stage and Rick gets a text message from his wife and said, there's a, there's an 11 day old baby in the hospital whose mom left and um, they had just signed up to foster. And so for me to be able to watch Rick, it's really, um, it's done a number on me to watch yeah. his, you know, 
the struggle he has with his family and this love for helping kids. And I was there. Right. And, you know, I chose one path and I don't think I could be more proud of Rick for really, you know, drawing a line and saying, Hey, I love the work that I do. I love helping kids, but I've got to dedicate time to my family. And, you know, I'm, I get a little envious of that sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. The relationship that he has and, and to watch him and his daughter, you know, on video, you know, cause I don't see them at all, you know, because we're on the road, but right. to see the relationship and to hear the stories, it's just, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And if I, if uh, I had no family, if my, if I did not find Amy and I did not have my girls, I would be on the road every single day and I would have sure. no qualm with it. Cause I love it. I really yeah. do. But yeah. once Amy came into my life, that had to change a little. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for answering that. You know, just, I, I can relate to, I'm not on the road nearly as much as you guys, but, but, you know, I'm the same boat and there's yeah. guilt there for sure. And then there's a love for what you do and the impact that you make. And so, yeah, it's a battle. Um, it, we're going to wrap it up because we're running out of time here, but what, you know, maybe there's one thing that you want to leave the listener with that, that, you know, if they were to implement into their life might help them move forward or might help someone in their life move forward. What, would, what might that be? Uh, for me, uh, it's, you know, we talk a lot about hope in, in schools, as Tom said, and we talk about sweethearts and sweethearts are the carriers of hope. They're the people in our lives who give us hope when we absolutely need it the most. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, I've needed hope many, many times in my life through my injury, um, through having my children, like there's this, you know, when we all need it and we all have to recognize that the hope that other people need is something that we already carry with us every day of our lives. And we can give it to those people that need it when they're the most in need. And when we mm -hmm. give people hope, uh, we change their lives. You know, I had a five-year-old little girl who changed my life forever. Never met her before that day. She changed my life. Never met her after, but she changed my life forever. And, uh, you know, the hope that we carry, it can change lives and it can also save lives. And mm -hmm. honestly, there's nothing bigger than that in this world. Right. So that's what I want people to recognize what you are capable of uh, for helping other people. It's more than help. It's hope. Love it. You know, I, I, you know, Rick told you he can read minds. And, you know, as you yeah. asked that question, the first thing that popped into my mind, and I told you that the name Sweetheart's Heroes is very purposeful. And when I got asked to do that original assembly, Nate, um, the first thing I did was sit down and look up the word bully. And when you look up that word, you find that in the 16th century, about 40 years after Columbus sailed, um, the beginning of the 1500s, the word bully was coined, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it actually meant sweetheart. And the funny oh, thing wow. is, Nate, it's a common thread that we all share as humans. And when I say a common thread, I mean, you wouldn't be on this podcast right now, Nate, if it wasn't for a handful of people when you were struggling. And it didn't have to be life or death. But when you were struggling, someone came into your life, one of your 16th century bullies, and they gave you hope. And as I told you, hope stands for hold on, possibilities exist. And when you felt like giving up, you know, they were there and they, they weren't always easy on you. Sometimes they had to kick you in the shorts and say, let's go get your crap and get in the car. You pick the stupid sport. Yeah. And uh, when you look back <laughs> on those people, Nate, those, they, those people changed the trajectory of your life. And I might be one of the most blessed human beings on planet earth because there's no one else on earth that's got to travel with one of the world's hope experts had their personal life changed, um, spoken to over 2 million kids about hope. Um, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the heroes part. And you know, heroes are just people that are willing to do things other people aren't willing to do. And they, and they do this magical thing called jumping into action. And really it's about action. It's about hope. And um, you know, I, I would say that you know, without Rick Yarish in my life, I wouldn't be the man I am today. I wouldn't be the father I am today. I wouldn't be the leader I am today. I wouldn't be the human being I am today. And I think that when we covet those 16th century bullies and we just honor them, then we get to turn into them. And then we get to recognize, as Rick said, that we all have this beautiful thing called hope inside of us. And it's a choice that we make to give it to other people. And that's what changes the world. And mm -hmm. um, I just couldn't be more blessed to to know Rick and to spend time with him and to continue to grow and to change the world with him. Yeah. 
Well, I sure appreciate you guys and and uh, what you what you're doing and the message that you have and and that you're going out and and you know you're sacrificing a bit of your own life to go and help others as well. And I'm sure you benefit a ton, just as much, if not more, from from what you do uh, in return as well. But thank you so much for being here. It's it's really been uh, an honor, and it's been one of the favorite podcasts I've had to date for sure. I'm only 400 in, so you know, let's say a little something. But uh, yeah, thank you guys. It's been great. We appreciate you, Nate. Thank you for all you do and your commitment to helping others. Yeah, yeah. What? Uh, before I forget, what, what's the best place to go? Sweetheart and Heroes on Instagram. Anywhere else to sweethearthandheroes.com? Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. That'd, yeah, too easy. Beautiful. Yeah, hopefully, our our paths cross again, Nate. And yeah, uh, I hope shoot so. me an email. I'd love to get your email, man. I'll, I will shoot you a few things on what we do and. Minnesota is a great wrestling state. Uh, very yeah, historic. Huge, huge. I got a good friend of mine that I wrestle with from Minnesota all the time still today. I was going to ask if you guys yeah, ever come in, into the area. Uh, no, never been to Minnesota definitely. yet. We've had okay. a couple inquiries in Minnesota. Yeah. I, I just yeah, watched. I have the... a couple ties too. So I don't know. I mean, if you if yeah. just, it sounds like you guys aren't lacking work, but, but uh, we're no. happy to see you guys. So, yeah. well, thanks again for the time today. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Nate. Thanks, Nate. All right, buddy.